Welcome tonight. My name is Milan Simard. I am an event facilitator here at McNally Robinson Booksellers. Uh, before we begin, I would like to acknowledge that we are in Treaty 1 territory and that the land on which we gather is the traditional territory of the Anishinaabe, Cree, OG Cree, Dakota, and any people, and the homeland of the Métis Nation. In addition, the McNally Robinson Booksellers itself rests on the land once occupied by the Métis community of Rooster Town. We are gathered here tonight to celebrate the launch of Owen Shock's Canada in Afghanistan, a story of military, diplomatic, political, and media failure from 2003 to 2023. An incisive, illuminating account of Canadian involvement in a war that costs lives and many billions of dollars. This evening will feature a presentation by Owen Schock, followed by a conversation between Schock and our host, Paul Graham. There will be an opportunity to ask questions afterwards. So if you do have a question, I will ask you to raise your hand. I will approach you with the microphone so that the people watching at home can hear you. And if you are one of those people watching on the live stream, please feel free to type your question in the chat and I will forward it along. I'll be back at the close of the event to review the signing procedure, but I will just ask you that um, when we're ready to do the book signing, you remain seated for a few moments while we bring Owen, Owen over to the signing table. Your host tonight is Paul Graham. He is a peace activist, a blogger, and a videographer who lives in Winnipeg. His writing and videography focuses primarily on Winnipeg's left activists and their causes. You can read more on his blog at paulsgram.ca. But first, please join me in welcoming Owen Schock, who will read a selection from his book. Hello, everybody. Thank you to everyone who came out for this book launch and to everyone watching from home. This book, Canada in Afghanistan, is a work of history, but it's also a work of political analysis, an analysis of what the war in Afghanistan was about, why Canada got involved, who benefited from that involvement, and who didn't. I'm sure everyone will be familiar with the narrative that was constructed around the war by the top brass of the Canadian military, successive Canadian governments, and the media. That narrative being one of a benevolent Canadian effort to bring democracy, education, women's rights and security to the supposedly benighted Afghan people. So what my book aims to do is explain why that narrative is lacking, where it's lacking, and the political reasons why that narrative was constructed in the first place, specifically what it's meant to obscure. Scott Taylor, a former Canadian infantryman and editor of the Esprit de Corps military magazine, described the war as, quote, a collective deception foisted on the Canadian public. Military journalist David Pagliassi said that during the Afghanistan war, Canadians were subjected to the most wide-ranging propaganda campaign since the Second World War. The fact is there's so much missing from national conversations about this war and Canada's role in it. And that includes the way that the Canadian public and indeed soldiers themselves were misled about the motives behind the mission. So this book is an effort to reclaim history that was marginalized during the years of occupation and ever since, history of both Afghanistan and of Canada. The book is also an anatomy of failure. The word failure is even in the subtitle. So what went wrong? Canadian soldiers were in Afghanistan from 2001 to 2014 in a mission that cost at least $18.5 billion and involves ground, naval, and air troops, special forces operations, psychological operations, including running a propaganda radio station in Kandahar, 
development projects, concentrated control over the media, and more. But I think in order to understand the failures of the mission, it is useful to first establish the mission's scope and its trajectory, the way that it developed and the forces and interests that generated its logic. So in the book, I divide the mission itself into four sections, each one represented by a major Canadian operation in Afghanistan. Operation Apollo from 2001 to three, Athena phase one from 03 to 05, Athena phase two going up to 2011, and Operation Attention from 2011 to 2014. These operations all had their own tactics and their own aims, but they operated in a geopolitical context that saw Canada working with the US and NATO in Washington's pursuit of a certain regional and global order. In the book, I lay out what I believe that order to be, one in which the energy resources of Central and South Asia were integrated under US auspices, the resource wealth of the region was open to Western investment, and other regional and global powers, including Iran, Russia, and China, were sidelined or rendered subordinate in that process. So after the 9-11 attacks, the US launched Operation Enduring Freedom, its mission to invade Afghanistan and topple the Taliban, which was viewed as an ally of Al Qaeda. At the same time, Canada launched Operation Apollo, which was its contribution to Enduring Freedom. And Apollo involved 7,000 troops uh, who were hand in glove with US forces and the mission also encapsulated almost every part of the Department of National Defense, including ground forces, Navy, air, and special forces, namely Joint Task Force Two. So when the Taliban were sent running and Apollo drew to a close in 2003, Canada moved into the first phase of Operation Athena. So Athena Phase One was based in Kabul, and it was meant to support the goals of the International Security Assistance Force, the ISAF which was this multinational coalition established in Bonn, Germany in 2001 uh, in a meeting of numerous global powers and Afghan anti-Taliban forces. So through Athena, Canada provided security for the new Afghan authorities as they organized elections for president and parliament. At the same time, CETA, uh, the Canadian International Development Agency, opened offices there. The Canadian ambassador was brought back and the Canadian uh, state's money really started to flow throughout the country. And thousands of Canadian soldiers were deployed to Afghanistan in this time as the new government and its backers got to work on the constitution, on elections and on forming a new state. It goes without saying that the Taliban were excluded from this process, but it should also be noted that the actors who were most empowered during these years were not the progressive forces of change in the country, not those fighting for gender equality or economic equality in Afghanistan. Uh, the factions which were most in power during this period of state building were warlords and militias associated with the Northern Alliance. This military alliance from Afghanistan's north consisting of mainly Tajiks, Uzbeks, Hazaras, and uh, groups that had plenty of reason to dislike the Pashtun Taliban organization. But in terms of social views and religious views, uh, they shared a lot of similarities with the Taliban. During these years, a lot of emphasis was placed on the holding of elections, our leaders seem to consider it a kind of baptism of the new state, an inauguration of a brand new Afghanistan based on wholly new values and institutions. Of course, there's a major disconnect between that branding and the reality of the situation. For example, the elections for which Canada provided security and funding fell short in many ways. Uh, the warlords were never disarmed, despite the population wanting that, knowing that intimidation would take place on a mass scale if they weren't. Multiple voting was widespread. Uh, Hamid Karzai, the president, even encouraged multiple voting, saying that Afghan people now had the right to exercise their democratic, their democratic principles through the vote, and if they wanted to do it more than once, well, we, we welcome it. And U.S. money flowed to the winning candidate, Karzai, in this time. So Athena phase one was also when Canada became deeply involved in the new Afghan state's economic policy through a team of 15 officers known as the SATA, Strategic Advisory Team Afghanistan, Canadian forces exercised influence over the new Afghan government out of all proportion to their actual size. And of course, Canada had its own material interests in crafting a new economic policy for Afghanistan. And we see that in the policy that the SATA helped produce. The Afghan National Development Strategy, which laid out the new economic orientation of the Afghan government was drafted with Canadian advisors and it laid out that privatization and foreign investment would be central to the new Afghanistan. 
and what followed the implementation of this policy. The role of the state diminished greatly and Afghanistan's resources were put up for sale to foreign companies, including Canadian companies, uh, one notable company being Kilo Gold Mines, which purchased part of the Hajigak mine, which has been called the largest untapped iron deposit in Asia. So after Karzai's power was entrenched in Kabul and his Canadian approved policies were implemented, the second phase of Athena began. And this saw Canadian forces move from Kabul to Kandahar, where they took over the Provincial Reconstruction Team or PRT from US forces. Canada specifically volunteered to take Kandahar because it was one of the most volatile provinces in the South. And Ottawa viewed this as a way to increase Canada's prestige within the NATO alliance. But there was another important factor and that was Iraq. As Chris Alexander, Canada's leading diplomat in Afghanistan stated, the US government was very happy to see Canadians take over Kandahar because it allowed those American troops to transfer to Iraq to help the occupation there. So we often hear that uh, Canada stood firm against the Iraq invasion, but we did support it in other less direct ways such as that. And it was under Athena phase two that we saw major operations like Mountain Thrust and Medusa, two large offensives involving uh, Canadians in Southern Afghanistan that were ostensibly successful at the time. David Frazier, the Canadian commander of Medusa even wrote a book titled Medusa, the furious battle that saved Afghanistan from the Taliban a little premature. And in the long run, we know these operations uh, were not successful. And it was in Kandahar that Canada helped to uh, began to expand its development programs to things like schools, health and education projects, the Dalla Dam, and a polio eradication campaign. These initiatives were much advertised, but they too were not successful. Though they did serve the important function of obscuring the fact that Canada was deeply involved in a counterinsurgency war and not as the mission was consciously branded, uh, a humanitarian peacekeeping mission. There's a lot more that can be said about this phase of the mission and I detail it in my book. The psychological operations that were conducted on the Afghan people, uh, many examples of journalists being prevented from covering certain topics or being pressured to cover other topics, uh, the attacks on civilians in the province that generated a lot of anger toward the occupation and even contributed to anti-Canadian marches in Kandahar and the gradual shift in Canadian public opinion, turning against the mission and wanting to bring the soldiers home. And by 2009, the majority of Canadians uh, endorsed this policy. But in the interest of time, I won't go through all of these in detail. Um, I detail them all uh, relatively in, in depth in my book. So when US troops returned to Kandahar in 2011, the, uh, the Canadians withdrew back to Kabul and began Operation Attention a training mission that saw Canada work with high-ranking members of the Afghan Defense Ministry. And during this time, Chris Alexander claimed that the Canadians were the second most important training force for the Afghan National Army, second only to the Americans. And over the course of the next few years, Canada gradually withdrew its forces so that by 2014, the mission was effectively closed. So that's a broad overview, but it doesn't really get at the question of why Canadian forces failed in their mission. And in order to get at that question, I wanna read a brief section from my book that will maybe shine some light on that. Through each of the four phases of Canadian military engagement, incidents cropped up that severely limited the Canadian forces ability to generate goodwill among the Afghan populace. These incidents received little coverage in Canadian media and were rarely discussed by government officials. The process by which Canada helped overthrow the Taliban and impose a new state was ostensibly democratic, but as already noted, it was tipped in favor of US allies such as Hamid Karzai and Northern Alliance warlords. These candidates received enormous funding packages from the US government and benefited from some Afghans voting for them multiple times, a practice that Karzai himself encouraged. Canada welcomed the results and funded another presidential election in 2009 which was again dominated by warlords, drug traffickers, and documented cases of fraud. Once more, US ally Karzai won the election handily. During the entire deployment, Canadian officials extolled the democratic conduct and values of their troops, while ignoring the deluge of polls that suggested Afghans would be happier without a foreign occupation. Indeed, most Afghans supported a negotiated end to the war rather than a prolonged counterinsurgency. In October 2007, an ABC News poll found that 57% of people in Afghanistan had a negative opinion of the US role there, and 55% of those surveyed in Kandahar disapproved of the NATO presence. 
A poll released by Environics that same month found that only 48% of respondents in Kandahar supported the direction their country was headed. Furthermore, of those who interacted directly with Canadian troops, less than half said the experience was positive. People who claimed a negative opinion of the Canadian presence in Kandahar listed the killing of innocent people and the searching of houses without permission as the two, rain, the two main reasons for their views. Some polls indicate that negative views of the occupation grew with time. For example, surveys conducted by NATO forces in 2010 found that upwards of 70% of people in Helmand and Kandahar opposed the coalition's military actions. Committees convened to analyze Canada's role in Afghanistan came to similar conclusions. In 2009, a think tank called the Senlis Council found that Canada's predominantly military intervention had resulted in significant civilian deaths and local discontent, and that the Afghan people generally do not distinguish between Canadian and American soldiers. In 2007, the Standing Senate Committee on National Security and Defense released a report criticizing the brutal actions of Canada's allies in Kabul. The report quotes an Afghan police colonel who claimed, quote, Canada has no chance of winning the support of the people of Kandahar as long as so many innocent Afghans are dying as a result of NATO airstrikes. Despite these revelations, the Canadian government extended the military's withdrawal deadline several times and continued to claim that counterinsurgency was the best way forward. In January 2008, the Independent Panel on Canada's Future Role in Afghanistan, nicknamed the Manly Report, released its parliamentary report, which called for the deployment of more NATO forces to Kandahar and more advanced military equipment to Canadian soldiers. In essence, the Manly Report argued that Canada's only option was to continue supporting U.S. goals in Afghanistan and the wider region by strengthening the Canadian military's ability to fight a long-term counterinsurgency war. By the time Canada finally withdrew its combat troops in 2011, the government had spent $18.5 billion in Afghanistan and spending continued even after the withdrawal. Operation Attention ran up a bill of $500 million, while Ottawa continued to fund the Afghan army for years after 2014. What did Canada have to show for its participation in the military occupation of Afghanistan? In retrospect, it seems that the mission produced little more than an abandoned dam in Kandahar a constellation of rarely used schools, countless dead Afghan fighters and civilians, 165 dead Canadians, more than 2,000 wounded, and a widely distrusted state apparatus based out of Kabul that dissolved like a sand sandcastle when US forces withdrew in August, 2021. Canada's defeat in Afghanistan did not stem from the Afghan people's failure to learn. Canadian forces fell short of all their major objectives because of the warlords they empowered the popular demands they ignored in favor of Washington's regional aims, the innocent people they helped torture and kill, and the logic of occupation and counterinsurgency they never abandoned. When understood this way, Canada's defeat in Afghanistan and the Taliban's victory come as no surprise. So in conclusion, I want to explain a little bit about why I wrote this book and what I hope it will achieve. By way of background, this began as a series of articles that I was writing for Canadian Dimension magazine in late summer and early fall of 2021. And that, that was the summer that we saw the Taliban's final offensive, the taking of Kabul, and a defeat for the US occupation that could not have been more decisive or resounding. So after August 15th, the day that Kabul fell, I was following US media closely, and I noticed there were some genuinely critical articles that examined the root causes of the US's defeat. I recall a New York Times article that analyzed how funds for Afghanistan uh, were applied. And this article found that of the $2 trillion the US Congress approved for Afghanistan, only 2% of that went toward developing the Afghan economy. And of course, a few years previous, we saw the Afghanistan papers, which revealed that high ranking officials in Washington knew the war was unwinnable, but continued to mislead the public about the possibility of victory. So there was some critical coverage coming out in the US, but in comparison, there was next to nothing that I could see in Canada. No efforts to tally the failures of Canada's role in the mission or to even interrogate the reasons why Canada went there in the first place. Well, it's true that Canadian combat forces had withdrawn from the country years before the US. I think the spectacle of Kabul falling so decisively to the Taliban should have provoked some kind of retrospection in Canada and it didn't. There hasn't been an Afghanistan papers for Canada. In the media and government, there doesn't seem to be any curiosity toward Canada's role in Afghanistan and how it may have contributed to the eventual defeat of the occupation forces. There's nothing. And that's what motivated me to start researching and writing about Canada and Afghanistan. 
as a series of articles at first, which eventually grew into this full-length book. And the idea at first was to prevent to present an overview of Canada's role in Afghanistan from 2001 to 2021, uh, and to stress aspects of the occupation that were not emphasized by media or government officials. But as I started writing, I realized there was so much relevant history I wanted to include. I realized how important it was when trying to understand the mission uh, to include deep historical analysis, things like Canada's promotion of free trade around the world, the move from Cold War anti-communism into the unipolar moment of US power, and the drift away from peacekeeping toward aggressive military missions undertaken alongside the US and NATO powers. So all of these threads braid together into a history, a trajectory that explains why Canada got involved in Afghanistan in the way it did. And it's a history that exceedingly few analyses of Canada and Afghanistan even attempt. So each chapter of the book interrogates a different aspect of the war, the military, the economic, the historical, the media side, and the hope is that all of these chapters come together to illuminate the Canadian side of the war from many different angles and thus present the well-rounded picture of the mission and its motivations that has been lacking in Canada for so many years. So that's the end of my remarks. I'd like to now welcome Paul Graham to ask me some questions about the book. That was uh, an excellent summary. I, I have to tell you, folks, uh, I read the book. Um, I read it, I reread it, I loved it. Uh, you're going to love it. it uh, it's a, a tremendous resource. I've been active in, um, in uh, uh, the peace movement for, uh, for many, many years, many years longer than I like to consider. And it's rare that we get um, excellent resources like that, that, that are uh, um, so well-researched, well-sourced, uh, well-written, accessible, and useful. I, I can see this as a teaching resource for years to come because it doesn't only talk about Afghanistan, but it provides uh, sort of a textbook for understanding how the Canadian military operates in the world. And uh, there's a lot of great historical context. So, you know, I just want to, uh, to thank you uh, for writing this book. Oh, thank Owen, you. Uh, <laughs> <those words. laughs> it's, uh, it, it's really superb. Um, the questions that I have brought are, are to illuminate things that, uh, that weren't in your presentation, which I, I, I think uh, are of particular interest to anybody who's concerned about how do we avoid getting into messes like this in the future? Um, you know, what are the, on, the ongoing belligerence of the Canadian government in uh, picking fights with uh, Russians and Chinese and Venezuelans and just about anybody else that they tend to disapprove of? And so it all comes down to selling war. So you, you devote a chapter uh, to exploring how uh, Canada's military and uh, Canada's media collaborated to sell the war to Canadians. You write, and I quote, a central yet critically understudied aspect of Canada's mission in Afghanistan involves how the military and media work together to present to the Canadian public with a whitewashed view of the conflict. I wonder if you can flesh that out. How, how did this system of collaboration uh, work, not only in Afghanistan, but you know, in, in other, uh, other wars at other times. Yeah, of course. So yeah, as you say, that relationship has existed for a long time. Uh, in the book, in the chapter that I devote to the media, I go back all the way to the World War, even before the First World War, but we can see this, this collaboration between the media and the military. Uh, I write a lot about the Korean War in that chapter, about how people like Lester B. Pearson in the government were really concerned with reports coming out of Korea uh, about towns being leveled by bombing, about Canadian troops um, committing crimes. There, there was one instance of Canadian troops uh, going to a Korean farmhouse, um, beating up the people who lived there and raping three women. And after that report came out, the Canadian embassy labeled the reporter as subversive. 
And then Lester Pearson, as he was looking at all of these reports about uh, Korean towns, North Korean towns leveled to the ground, he said, we need stricter censorship so that Canadian people don't read this. And going up to the first Gulf War, we can see how this process was refined through something called the Ground Rules Agreement that the Canadian military imposed on journalists. And essentially what this is, is an agreement that lists the topics that journalists can cover and the topics that they can't cover. And if journalists want to be embedded with Canadian troops, they have to sign this and agree not to cover certain things. And we, we saw that happen during the Afghanistan occupation as well. There are a lot of journalists on the ground um, who, in trying to cover certain topics, encountered a lot of resistance from the Canadian military and from public affairs officers who were trained to manage journalists in such a way to present their readers with a positive image of the mission. Um, I recall one instance of Scott Taylor, when he was embedded with Canadian troops, he attended the opening of a school in Afghanistan, uh, which was a big event. There was a ribbon cutting ceremony, local officials attended, and they were saying, oh, this is, this is going to be great. Thank you, Canada, for building us a school. And then he went back later when he was unembedded, and there were no students there. The staff was just sitting around uh, playing cards and drinking tea, and no children at all were, were being educated. This was just really a public affairs venture and nothing more. And I think on the media side of things, we can see a lot of collaboration too, and a lot of willingness to just accept the government line on, on wars like this. I quote a study by an academic, Brooks DeCilia, who analyzed all of these, all of these articles coming out at the, at the time about Afghanistan. And they found that um, half of all articles will use only military and government officials as primary sources. And about 45% of all articles will use no secondary sources, but the most common secondary source was military and government officials. Um, but another stat that's just occurring to me is that Canadian media was 11 times more likely to quote a Canadian official than an Afghan official or civilian, and 158 times more likely to quote a government official than an anti-war activist. So we can see this deluge of pro-war propaganda coming out of the Canadian media and a total sidelining of critical views. So I think, yeah, that, that was a great question to help illuminate that side of things. It goes beyond media too, doesn't it? Um, a colleague of yours at, at Canadian Dimension, I'm, I'm gonna put in a plug for Canadian Dimension magazine for people who are geek. Yeah. The founder was sitting right there, Saigonic. Sai, it's so good to see you tonight. Uh, Henry Heller, another uh, long-term, long-time uh, editor of, of the magazine. Uh, I myself have got 15 or 20 years, but you know, it, it's been around for 60 years. It's an institution. Anyway, Eve Angler, uh, who uh, has written uh, quite a number of books on, on Canadian foreign policy, observed in a recent book of his that, um, that the Department of National Defense has got the largest public relations um, department of all of the uh, uh, departments in, uh, in the Canadian government. It's huge, hundreds of officials uh, on the payroll uh, to, to do more than just massage the media. Um, and I wonder if you could talk about some of the strategies that, that the government, you know, going beyond media relations, some of the other strategies that, that uh, uh, national defense and the, the military uh, and the government more generally uh, have followed to uh, promote the Afghan war, the, 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 uh, the militarism, uh, the, uh, the myth of, of, of Canadian exceptionalism. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot, especially during the Afghanistan war, uh, things like military outreach that Stephen Harper uh, increased funding for. So that would involve um, making sure that there's pro-war coverage in the media, going to schools, libraries, things like that. Just public outreach initiatives to um, make the public perception of the, the military more positive. Uh, another big one during Afghanistan was celebrity outreach. So that would involve DND reaching out to celebrities. Uh, Rick Mercer was a big one who went to Afghanistan, Don Cherry, people like that. Bubbles from Trailer Park Boys, weirdly. Um, and so DND would reach out to these people and would offer to pay to take them to Canadian bases in Afghanistan. And when they got there, 
Uh, they would be photographed shaking hands with troops, with generals. Uh, Rick Mercer was photographed uh, serving Tim's coffee to troops. And they would be man managed the whole time by something called the personnel, um, forgetting it now, the CFPSA is the acronym. And their whole purpose was to manage these celebrity visits when they came to Afghanistan to make sure that they were covered in a positive way in the Canadian media. And they talk quite openly about what the point of that is. It's to put a non-political face on war in order to reach out to Canadians who wouldn't normally be exposed to pro propaganda or wouldn't normally be amenable to it. They would see their favorite celebrities in Afghanistan and they would think, well, this is great. You know, I know, I know Rick Mercer, I like him. Here he is in Afghanistan saying they're doing great things. So that was the point of the, of the celebrity outreach, yeah, which is another really important aspect in the Afghanistan mission. Um, you, you made reference uh, to uh, the lack of uh, an Afghanistan papers uh, in, in the Canadian experience. Um, in, in, in your book, actually, you, you, uh, you say, and I, I quote, government documents that would shed light on Ottawa's decision-making process during the war remain highly protected, even more so than in Washington. In December 2019, the Afghanistan Papers, a compilation of hundreds of interviews with U.S. officials, revealed that Washington knew the war was unwinnable, but continued lying to the public about the potential for victory. There has not been an Afghanistan Papers for Canada, although similar documents exist, end of quote. Now, I was reminded of this this morning, actually, uh, reading uh, the CBC News and uh, an article by uh, Murray Brewster. I don't know if uh, people saw this, but I, I thought it was, it was uh, so telling. Um, the article is uh, about a, a book that was uh, completed about a decade ago by... Uh, an historian at the Royal Military College, and it's a three volume uh, detailed history of the Afghanistan war um, from somebody who was given almost unprecedented access. He spent months being embedded with uh, uh, Canadian troops and, uh, and had, because of his position at, at RMC, had all kinds of access to all kinds of documentation and so on and so forth. And he, uh, 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 he, he started this book. It was commissioned by DND in 2007. He finished it by 2014, around the time that Canada was withdrawing its, its troops from Afghanistan. And for the last 10 years, uh, it's gone back and forth amongst various senior officials who were objecting to things that he wrote because he was too independent minded, I guess. And Brewster writes, quotes, publication was held up for almost a decade by reviews and debates within DND and the Canadian forces about Maloney, the author. Uh, Maloney's often blunt assessments, his criticism of Canada's allies and other government departments, his questioning of some decisions by senior commanders, end of quote. So they've printed a few hundred of these books, uh, but they have no plans to sell them. They are talking about perhaps having an ebook available, but there's no commitments. This is from the publisher, of course, the Department of National Defense. Now, I imagine having read your book, uh, that it would not be very popular with these folks as well. Uh, but I'm curious, have you had any, uh, any sense of how your book is viewed in official circles? Uh, and, you know, has, has the Canadian media shown any interest uh, in reviewing it or, or contacting you? Or? I don't know if my book is viewed in those circles, period. <laughs> yeah, there's been very little interest. I, mean, I, I have no idea if people in like official circles are reading it at all or even though it exists. Uh, I imagine they wouldn't uh, be particularly open to some of the arguments I make, or maybe they would. Uh, th there are people, or there were people in the Canadian government working on the ground in Afghanistan who their view changed as the war went on. And one that I quote from a lot is Nipa Banerjee, who headed CETA in Afghanistan. And in her time there, she grew very disillusioned with the way that the Canadian government managed the aid programs there. And by the time that she left CETA, uh, she would write a lot of critical articles about Canadian aid and Canadian development initiatives. She would write that they serve no purpose, no practical purpose in Afghanistan, and their only aim seemed to be increasing Canadian visibility and prestige on the world stage. And this is somebody who 
ran CETA. She, she was like in those circles, in those conversations. And that's the conclusion that she came to. Uh, so my book, uh, I mean, I don't know if anybody in those circles is reading it, but it, it is possible that there would be people in those circles or who have been who would find my arguments compelling. The, uh, the Reuters Institute in, in 2022 uh, produced a report that reported that trust in the Canadian news media had sunk to its lowest point in seven years. They had data from 2016 through to the end of 2022. And the study, um, which was produced uh, by the Reuters Institute for the Study of Journalism at the University of Oxford, has found that trust in the news dropped 13% since 2016. Only 42% of Canadian respondents trust, quote, quotes, most news most of the time. Um, the same report noted that there's been an uptick in the willingness of, uh, of Canadians to pay for online news. You write for Canadian Dimension and for other left-wing publications. How would you assess the health of the alternative press in Canada? I mean, an alternative independent media is an essential resource, I would say. Uh, some of the stuff that I cover for Canadian Dimension, for example, these articles wouldn't be published in mainstream papers. Uh, and, and yeah, I mean, it's so important to keep these publications alive. And I think that the Canadian alternative media scene is in a really interesting position. I think that based on emails that I've received from, from readers, we have a lot of readers in Canada and even around the world. I mean, people who um, have, they've adopted this view of Canada that comes from the way Canada brands itself on the international stage as a champion of democracy, equality, the environment, things like that. But of course, there are people in these countries who their experience of Canada has been through a Canadian mine that poisons their water or the security of, of these of these companies killing protesters in their village. And I've received emails from those people, somebody recently from Panama. Uh, right now in Panama, there's a nationwide uprising against a Canadian mine there, and that's not being covered much in Canadian media, but that is happening. And I received an email from somebody in Panama saying, thank you for covering this because I've checked Canadian media and it's not being covered anywhere else. It's only Canadian dimension and smaller alternative publications that, that care about this story. So yeah, I mean, keeping independent alternative media alive is necessary if we wanted to have these stories covered uh, and in order to educate Canadians, but also people around the world and to show them that there are Canadians who do care about what's going on in their country and Canadians who do see through the propaganda. I have uh, two quick questions and then we can move to questions from the audience. Uh, one of them has really uh, not a lot to do with media at all, but with the conduct of the uh, Canadian government since the uh, Taliban uh, regained power. And I wonder if you could comment on, on just exactly uh, how shamefully our government has been behaving uh, since, uh, since the uh, Taliban resumed government. Yeah, absolutely. So the Taliban took over in August 2021, they regained control of the country. And then in February, 2022, the Biden administration seized, seized Afghan central bank reserves worth $7 billion. And this is at a point in time where Afghanistan is still war torn, trying to rebuild after the war. And suddenly their central bank reserves were gone. And we saw mal malnutrition skyrocket in the country. 95% of Afghans were not getting enough to eat. And during this time, international aid organizations were trying to make up for this by bringing in food, medicine, things like that. And some of them were coming from Canada. But the Canadian government has these laws on the books, which they call anti-terror laws, which criminalize the delivery of aid to Afghanistan. So one example of that is a charity called World Vision wanted, wanted to deliver food to Afghanistan, which they estimate would have fed about 2,000 children and the Canadian government blocked it. They said, no, you can't, because the delivery of this food might incur taxes to the Taliban, which is a terrorist organization, so you would be funding terrorism if you delivered food to Afghanistan. And throughout 2022, aid organizations were going to the Canadian government to parliament saying, we have like warehouses of food and supplies that we can't deliver because 
you will criminalize us if we deliver this aid. And finally, toward the end of the year, uh, the Trudeau government announced that they would find an aid loophole in, in these laws. And I don't know if they have, I haven't seen any follow-up reporting on that. Uh, somebody did reach out to me who donated to a Canadian charity in Afghanistan, and they were confident that that money was going to make it to Afghanistan and it would be distributed on, on the ground. So the situation might be getting a little better in terms of aid coming through Canada, but I would say that over the course of 2022, uh, the Canadian government's policy toward Afghanistan was, as you said, it was shameful. They were actually blocking food from getting into the country that would have fed Afghan children. It certainly is, uh, is shocking. Uh, not only is the Canadian government incapable of rescuing the people who collaborated with it uh, during the war, but they continue to punish the, uh, the Afghan people. Well, and that, if I could just add too, I mean, we spent so long saying that we were in Afghanistan to help the people, to help them develop, to bring them all these great things. And then the second the Taliban take over, we suddenly don't care about any of them. We don't care if they starve, we don't care if they have medicine. The bad guys won, so we, we don't care. And I don't know if that's a difference. I don't know if that's vindictiveness toward Afghanistan because they, they kicked out the West. I don't know what it is, but it's really appalling. It certainly is. On, a, on another slightly happier but still appalling note, you've got a, a, another book coming out in early uh, 2024 that you've co-authored with uh, Eve Angler. I wonder if you can give us a, a little preview of what that's all about. Yeah, so Eve and I wrote a book together, which is a history of coups around the world that Canada has supported, either actively or passively. So in our research together, we found over 20 coups, again, mostly against democratically elected governments that Canada supported, uh, from Colombia, the military takeover there in the early 50s, to uh, a lot of people don't know that when Idi Amin seized control of Uganda, Canada supported him because he returned a Canadian company that was nationalized under the previous government. And we go through uh, so many, Peru, recently Bolivia, Venezuela, uh, yeah, I'm blanking on a lot of them, but it's over 20, active or, or passively supported. And I, I think it'll be a great resource. As far as I'm aware, it's the only book that has attempted to compile all of these coups that Canada has supported. And I mean, Eve is one of the best people writing on Canadian foreign policy. So it's really unbelievable and an honor that I was able to, to work with him on this book. Well, I'm certainly looking forward to uh, to uh, doing another book launch with you. Oh yes, absolutely. <laughs> on that particular thing, okay. I think we'll uh, we'll um, break for questions from uh, the assembled audience. Um, there's a microphone that's going to be going around, and please use that so that it gets recorded on, uh, clearly for you too. Do we have any questions in the audience? So uh, I wonder where you go to get your information if you can read the papers and turn on the CBC. Maybe you can enlighten us as to uh, some of your trusted sources. You mentioned Eve Engler. I'm uh, currently enjoying his weekly podcast, his foreign policy uh, program. But yes, uh, would you mind enlightening us a little bit about uh, where you go? I mean, for Canadian news, there's Canadian Dimension, there's Ravel, the Maple is good. Um, I do read a lot of mainstream media. I'll check CDC, CTV, Global Mail, National Post, Al Jazeera, I think, is, is pretty, pretty good on a lot of things. It's coverage of Gaza right now. I've, I've been following that very closely. And in terms of the book, um, I, I read a lot about um, people who are actually in Afghanistan, uh, soldiers, like foot soldiers up to lieutenant colonel, their memoirs, people who are in the Afghan government, the Canadian government at the time. And I think that's, that's useful to do um, on a lot of issues, is to actually read the way that these people view the world, to try to understand their thinking, but do it from a critical perspective. And, you know, consume mainstream media too, but do it from the same perspective. You know, apply your own heuristic to, to the news that you read so that you get the information, but that you aren't fooled by a certain angle or a slant that it might have. But in terms of publications that, that I align with politically, I mean, yeah, it's Canadian Dimension, Rabble, uh, The Maple, things like that. 
Other questions? Leslie, uh, wait for the microphone, please. Thank you. I, I did hear and read and come across this in several places. And that was the idea that there may have been more suicides by Canadian troops than actual fatalities uh, in service. I'm sorry to introduce something so depressing, but I'm, I'm curious to know whether that is somebody's you know, dramatization or whether it's close to being accurate. And if it is, what would account for that? I mean, if, if that is accurate, it wouldn't surprise me. I mean, war is hell. It's, it's awful. It's the failure of the human spirit, as, as I heard Chris Hedges say once. So, yeah, it's, it's no shock to me that people would be impacted so deeply by, by those experiences. Um, but I think that's why it's important to have an anti-war perspective also, to say that wars are terrible and should be avoided at all costs, because it's not only the combat deaths, it's not only the civilian deaths, it is the after effects as well. As you say, the, the, the suicide rates, the trauma that is inflicted on people. So yeah, in, in terms of that stat that you read, um, I don't know if it's entirely true. I, I haven't seen it, but I'm not, I'm not shocked at all. Do you have a question? Thank you, I'm looking forward to reading your book, especially the chapter on media. I really think as Canadians, one of the biggest things that we can do is to try and get accurate portrayal and coverage of foreign affairs and particularly military um, actions in war. And I'm, I'm starting to think lately, and I wonder if you can comment on this, what are the current penalties for misleading the public? Is it a war crime to misrepresent the facts, to have biased coverage, to you know, vilify peace activists and peace movement? All the things that are going on, in your awareness, what? What would you say about that? And the other question I'm curious, you're a young guy, and I'm curious what politicized you? Like what has got you to do the kind of research and writing that you're doing? So the first question on like accountability, I guess, for misleading the public, I don't, I don't know, in, in terms of like media complicity in war crimes, if, if that's what you're getting at. No, it is, a, is it, can it be a war crime? to uh, knowingly spread propaganda to build support for war. See, I don't know. That's a legalistic question, I think, and that's not something that I, I think I'm equipped to answer. Um, I think you raise an important point about the way that the media is complicit in dehumanizing certain people in order to make the, in order to make the public accept horrible things that happen to them. Like we see that in Gaza right now. And the second question, and what politicized me? I don't, I don't even know. I'm not sure. Uh, I don't, just reading widely, I guess. Uh, I remember my first year of university being in Professor Henry Heller's course, learning about things like the Russian Revolution, the Cuban Revolution, the French Revolution, and thinking, this is just amazing history. Why didn't I learn this uh, in high school or junior high? Like, I just, I had no idea. And that, it sparked an interest in me. It got me reading widely. I eventually came across people like Noam Chomsky, people who had a more critical perspective on global affairs. And yeah, that, that eventually led me to, to where I am today, researching the topics that I research, writing what I write. Yeah, that's how it happened. And Henry? Well, um, uh, always one of my prizes. Uh, it, it actually sometimes uh, university teaching it actually can have some effect on students, <laughs> which I'm gratified. And uh, what I want to raise is the fact that this book, which I haven't read, but, uh, which I, I wish I, I'm, I'm looking forward to reading, the the case that uh, Owen makes here. It shows that following this fiasco in Afghanistan, we have the Ukrainian war, we have the, uh, the, the conflict with China. And 
the 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 media the media military uh, political sort of structure that uh, runs these operations um, seems uh, that there were no consequences uh, in terms of these people for what they did in Afghanistan, and they've gone on to uh, even greater heights with the um, Ukrainian war and the war against China. And so um, the whole question of how one uh, confronts this and provides uh, people with uh, alternative views is absolutely central to the problem of politics that, that we have today in the world, it seems to me. Uh, there is a certain sense that, as Paul's comment, uh, or a, a comment uh, about the fact that the Canadian public is losing trust in the media, is an indication that there is some change. But, uh, you know, the fiasco that uh, occurred in Parliament with the uh, exposure of this guy, Hunka, or whatever. And the, the whole thing seemed to explode, uh, the sham of uh, what, what Canada is really up to. And yet, uh, they will recycle this. They'll depend on people's amnesia, and they'll continue unless they're stopped in some way. Yeah, you're absolutely right, especially in terms of people who are complicit in, in the horrors of the quote-unquote war on terror, like still being with us, still influencing media coverage, public receptions, I mean, shit rolls uphill. And we see that people failing upwards, people who were wrong about everything that happened in Iraq, wrong about Afghanistan, they're now telling us what's going on in Russia or what's going on in China, what's going on in Venezuela, like Cuba, whatever. So yeah, it is important to, to not listen to those people, to look for people who maybe said, said the right things about Iraq and Afghanistan and predicted what would happen there. People now who are writing critically about Russia, about China, about these very important issues, you know, look out for those people, for those voices, and don't listen to the governments that cause the fiascos and, and the devastation and the, the destruction of the war on terror. Don't listen to those people. Look for your information elsewhere. And never believe something until it's been officially denied. <laughs> Are there other questions? There's one over in the, there's a couple in the back there. Uh, thanks for your presentation. I just wanted to ask, uh, one of my main sources is Democracy Now! You didn't mention that one. I wondered what your evaluation is of the media coverage on that, uh, on that radio uh, podcast. Yeah, Democracy Now! is good. Uh, that, was, that was part of my politicization too was getting exposed to like the work of Amy Goodman and the people involved with Democracy Now. There were a few issues. Um, their reporting around a few issues made me feel a little jaded, uh, like the whole Trump-Russia thing. They, they seem to take that more seriously than, than other outlets. Some of their coverage of, of different issues in the Middle East, uh, I think is a little wonky. But yeah, I mean, Democracy Now is definitely a good resource. It's better than 99% of the media outlets that, that we see that, that clog our, our airwaves, that are crowd around, that crowd up our internet. So yeah, Democracy Now! is, is definitely a good resource. It's worth checking out. Uh, actually, my question is relating to the uh, last couple of uh, speakers or questioners. And actually, Henry, and I'd like to say that I am a former student of Henry's and it did have quite an effect. <laughs> So my observation of the current Gaza uh, situation and in particular uh, Canadian media is that Sija, which presumably speaking people are familiar with the Canadian Israeli, uh, Israeli Jewish uh, alliance and uh, on supporting Canada seem to have, let's say, uh, had a great chilling effect on critical coverage of what occurs in the entire Middle East. And I think it's extremely healthy for a public debate. And there's real consequences in this world that people be killed. So does the speaker have any comment on that 
I, I realized I could talk an alternative media company, but there seems to be a very organized push to chill even uh, mainstream media to actually uh, attempt to uh, report objectively and call it objectively. So, very important uh, area of the world now. Yeah, I think you're right about the chilling effect. Um, we can see around Europe right now, especially countries like Germany, these very repressive measures being deployed against anti-war protesters, against anti-genocide protesters uh, around the issue of Gaza. In Canada too, um, I'm, I'm blanking on their names, but there have been a few people who have been fired from news outlets for posting pro-Palestinian sentiments. But I think it's important to consider that this chilling effect is largely a reaction against an upsurge of support for Palestine. And this upswell of refusal to take seriously certain things that the Israeli government says, that its backers in the West say. I've, I mean, I'm pretty young, but I've heard from people who have been organizing around this issue for a long time, that there's never been as much pro-Palestinian sentiment as there is now that these protests that we've seen, weekly protests around Canadian cities, American cities, European cities, that that would have been unthinkable decades ago. So I think there's cause for hope in that sense, and that it should be recognized that the repressive measures that are being deployed are largely a reaction against that, that upsurge, which is evidence, I think, that it scares them. And it's just all the more reason to, to keep organizing and commenting on this issue. Okay, I'm going to make a comment about something that I see that Seja, for example, and the lobbyists from uh, Canadian-Israeli Alliance and the Federation of Jews, which was a hostile takeover of the Jewish Congress, and so they no longer allow dissent, dissent in that particular, those two bodies. I think they have a lot, we have a lot to learn from them in terms of effective approaches. So one of the Concerns I have about alternative media is that it, um, I think that, and I, the analogy I may think is the cockroach approach, and I don't know that that's a very nice approach that the lobbyists use, but it is certainly effective. Uh, and I came up close and personal to them with that approach, because I was at the City Hall Human Rights presentation when they were trying to put through the International Holocaust, whatever it is, the, the one that stifles the criticism of Israel and that equates criticism of Israel with anti-Semitism, which was passed unanimously by our provincial legislature and has also been passed by the federal government. So we now have a policy in place that equates criticism of Israel with anti-Semitism. And that is certainly chilling and silencing and allowing all sorts of things to happen. So how did these people who are not nearly as intelligent or well-educated as the alternative media people are, how is it that they are so effective in putting forth the most crappy, idiotic uh, messaging that uh, really that that defies belief that it, it goes, but they have very effective strategies and their lobbyist strategies. And you know, I ran up against Dougal Lamont, who I thought I really respected, and also John Gerard. And I tried to make a comment to Dougal about you know the fact that he was assaulted when he spoke up at. Uh, one of the um, Federation of Jews and whatever it was there, and he said, oh, Eve Abner, he just started to like, dismiss me, so oh, that's Eve Abner. Like he can be assaulted because look what he does. And it was this utter and absolute ignorance of these very intelligent, I thought, and pretty decent human beings. John Gerard was just, I was shocked. I was just utterly war shocked when I came out of after a meeting with him because they bought the party line, hook, line, and sinker. And I know that he was flown to Gaza, or flown to Jerusalem to have the wine tasting and show what a democracy. He came back and told me, it's a democracy. Look at all the three religions get along really well. And so he thought he was promoting world peace by being the person who put through that chilling but voice uh, passed to the legislature, the provincial legislature, supported by the NDP. Uh, that 
puts criticism of Israel, equates it with anti-Semitism. So, and, and their strategies are really back room. They don't ever allow themselves to be exposed to public light if they can avoid it. The only time that they were defeated was when the city hall fostered a very democratic process so both sides of the argument could be heard fully and with great respect. And even at the then they were like the mumbling, I, I, I shouldn't use the words I was gonna say, but uh, the mumbling behind talking about these so-called Jews who are standing up and talking about the apartheid in Gaza. So I guess it's kind of like the languaging, it's kind of like the marketing there's all these promotions and marketing pitches that seem to be critical to get the message out. You know, you've got to have your tagline. I think they have three basic ones. And that's all. If they don't, I think that we have a lot to learn about how they can be so effective and be so dumb. I'm going to interject here. To, so thank you for that, uh, Jude. Um, it's uh, two minutes after eight. Uh, told that we're two minutes over time. <laughs> but um, before giving the last word to our author, I wonder, are, are there any questions that uh, uh, people have? Anybody else? Going once, going twice. Owen, do you have any final words before going off to sign the books that all of these fine people are going to buy? Uh, just, just keep reading, keep, keep a critical mind, keep an open mind, and yeah, try to see through the propaganda of the Canadian state. Thank you. So Owen's going to be sitting somewhere. Yes. You want to tell us where? <laughs> yes. Um, we'll ask everybody to remain seated for just a few moments. We're going to transport Owen over by the cash desk uh, at the signing table. There will be books available behind the cash desk and also at the signing table. So feel free to grab one and get it signed. But uh, please don't forget to pay for it uh, before you leave the store. <laughs> and I'd just like to warmly thank you, Owen Chalk. Uh, thank you, Paul Graham. Um, what a wonderful conversation tonight. Thank you all for coming. Well done. Good going for